football. And here's what happens. I've watched football growing up. When I lived at home with my dad, I had no choice but on Sundays to watch football. Um, but I always loved it, and I would really be into it. And then the older I got, the, 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 the poorer Jason and I were and didn't have access to cable and stuff, the less football I watched over the years. And now we have it again, and I'm like, eh, I kind of lost my interest. But I know this, that football is not just a game where you get out there on the field and you just start playing. There's a lot of strategy that's involved in football. I remember back in the day playing my dad's Nintendo, the original, like the NES system. Anybody play NES back in the day? Yeah. Tech Mobile. The graphics were amazing, you guys. We thought it was so cool, and then I look at it now, and I'm like, how did I, what, what is this? Is that a football? But you remember the little, the little strategies, the little game plays would pop up, and it'd be the X's and the O's, and you get to pick your play. And, um, and it was all about strategy. You try to outwit. Now, the computer was not a great processor back then, so there weren't that many things to choose from. Now it's even more complicated when people are playing Madden and stuff. And I also remember just in fun, my dad would take my sister and me to the park, and we were only like 11, we're only 11 plus months apart, and um, we would play football. That would be one of the fun things we did with my dad on the weekends. He'd take us to the park. He was all-time quarterback, and we just played one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> Good times. My sister rolled her ankle, broke it one time. But he would huddle us up, me and whoever was on the offense. We'd huddle with the all-time quarterback, and he'd be like, all right, you're going to go out for the button hook. And he'd do the little play on his, hand, on his chest and ride it and do this, what we're going to do. And there was always strategy involved. There was never a time when you just went out there and played without any kind of strategy. And oftentimes, the team that wins doesn't just have the best players. They have the better players coupled with the better game plays, with the better strategy. Likewise, we live this life, we walk our Christian life out, not haphazardly. The Lord hasn't just thrown us into this world and he says, good luck. May the best one win. It, it's not like the Hunger Games, all right? May the odds ever be in your favor. No, he gives us a strategy. Why? Because we also have an enemy who has a strategy. And here's what the Bible says in John 10, 10. Jesus is speaking, and he says, the thief comes only, make no mistake, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. He's speaking to his followers, and he's explaining to them that, listen, there is an enemy, there is one out there who comes, and his only goal is to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's his game plan. And he employs all sorts of different strategies in order to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Sometimes he wraps those destroying goals up in pretty little packages that look enticing, and it looks very uh, pleasurable for a season, the Bible says. But in the end, all the enemy does is to seek to, to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus says, but it's okay because I have come. Literally, he came. God eternal inhabits flesh. I have come in flesh that you may have life and have it more abundantly. Right? That's his goal. That's why Jesus came. And not only did he come to do that, but he laid out for us in his word and by his life how we can live, how we can walk out this life wisely, strategically as believers and followers in Jesus to win to overcome, to make it till the end, to last faithfully until the end, and to defeat the enemy who seeks only to steal, to kill, and to destroy. In Ephesians 6.10, it says this, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes, against his strategies. For our struggle, friends, is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. There is an enemy who has a strategy to destroy us. But we serve a God if we are in Christ Jesus, and we have the spirit of God living in us, who is greater than he who is in the world. And not only does God operate through us, but he calls us to know his word and to live out his word. It is his strategy. It is the game-winning strategy. And so all we have to do then is trust him, rely on him. But that looks 
not, that doesn't look passive. That doesn't look like just sitting by and saying, okay, God, today I'm, so, I'm afraid of the enemy. He's coming to steal, to kill. God, just protect me today. No, no. You put on the armor. It says you put it on. You take your stand. You walk out the strategy. You run out the gameplay if you want to win. In 2 Peter 1.3, it says his divine power has granted us everything. How many things? Everything pertaining to life and godliness. To the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. Man, what a wonderful thing to know. What a wonderful truth to grab hold of. That in Christ Jesus, you and I have everything we need for life and godliness. Man, we want to claim all sorts of things in Jesus' name. I have everything I need, and we really want to misconstrue those things to make that mean something it was never intended to mean. That doesn't mean that we will be the richest person on the block. It doesn't mean that we will be the one with the best car or the best house or the prettiest wife. What it means is that we have everything we need to walk out this life victoriously, to beat the enemy who seeks to steal, to kill, and to destroy. It means when the enemy launches his attacks at us, we are fully armed with the armor of God, the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, and we are armed with the sword of truth so that we can advance the kingdom of God and do what he has called us to do. And we can last until the very end. Should he not come back when we're alive, then we will be part of the ones who are raised first in Christ, the dead who are raised in Christ. But if we're here when he comes, then we will be taken up with him. That is the goal, to last until the end, to remain faithful to the king of kings until he returns. That is what it means to win. And so he has given us all we need for that. And so today I want to kind of look at what these strategies are. What the, the strategy of the enemy is, the ways that he tries to get us off course, the way that he tries to um, get us down and to cause us to give up, but then how we can beat that with God's winning strategy. So the first thing that we can do, I think, according to Scripture, is that we can beat distraction with focus. One of the easiest ways the enemy can get us off course is to distract us. I remember serving the Lord so passionately as a young person. I really did come to a place in my life, and it was about, um, I think, it, I, so I loved the Lord the whole time. Like, I was little, grew up really passionate about the Lord, loved the Word, memorized a lot of it. I had a great children's church, a great family that taught me the Word, loved it. And then there was just one little season of my life where I kind of just walked away from God, wasn't in church all the time, really, it, I got really sad a lot because I knew I wasn't where I should be with the Lord. But then right about um, eighth grade, I, I really got passionate about the Lord. And I remember from that point on, every time that I would go to youth camp with all of my youth group, and I had a pretty large youth group, over 200 students. So at camp, there would be about 80 of us just from our church. And we would go to camp with all of these hundreds and hundreds of teenagers, and everybody would be fired up ready to go back and take their campuses for Jesus. Anybody share similar experiences? Right? Okay. Inevitably, though, inevitably, every year, I would watch one by one as some of those kids that were the most passionate, the most expressive in worship, the most gung-ho, that's it, when I go back, I'm telling everybody about Jesus within a few weeks. I would be like, hey, I didn't, I didn't see them at, at youth group tonight. Do you know where they were? Oh, yeah, they had football. Hey, I didn't see so-and-so at you. Hey, where were you? I didn't see you. Oh, you know, I, I wanted to hang out with my boyfriend, so I didn't come. Oh, okay. And it wasn't these huge things that in and of themselves were sinful, but they were distractions. They were little things that looked good, that didn't look so harmful, but it would just cause enough, enough of a turning away from Jesus to eventually lead them down a path where it was a lot harder to find to find where Jesus wanted them to be. And that doesn't just happen to young people. That happens to adults. It happens to, to people that have been serving the Lord for many, many years. Distractions come. And the devil wraps them up in all sorts of different packages. Sometimes it's the stresses of life. The air conditioner breaks. The car breaks down. Somebody, you know, breaks an arm and you have to go to the ER and you have, uh, you know, bill after bill after bill because, you know, 
who knew labs cost so much money? Right? And you're like, what? And it's just little distractions. It's the time stealers. It's this. Distractions. But here's what the word says, that, that we are called, if we are in Christ Jesus, not only are we called, we are empowered to overcome distractions with a clear-cut focus, with laser-like focus. And the only thing that we should have our eyes fixed on and set on is Jesus, the only one, I should say, whom we should have our eyes set on. In Hebrews 12.1, it says, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Boy, don't get tripped up. Don't get caught up. Just keep running. Keep running and keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Ooh, that looks pretty over there. No, 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 no. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Oh, that looks really fun. Uh, 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 keep your eyes on Jesus. Because when you keep your eyes on Jesus, guess what? He will give you everything you need for life and godliness. He will give you an abundant life, not just a mediocre life. He will give you all of the fun that you desire and crave because your heart will be set and ordered to crave the right kind of fun. He will give you all of the relationships that you need because your heart will be ordered to crave and to desire the right kind of relationships that build you up, not tear you down. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Stop seeking everything else to fill a void that only he can fill. Don't get distracted. Don't allow the enemy's tricks and schemes and strategy of distraction to move your eyes away from Jesus because as soon as you do, it doesn't take much longer before you start getting tripped up. Proverbs 4, 25 and 27. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your great gaze directly before you. Give careful thought to the paths for your feet and be steadfast in all your ways. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Keep your foot from evil. Guys, have you ever driven with someone who really likes to talk with their hands and look around when they talk? I'm not, I'm not naming any names, but my father might be one of those people. <laughs> Pastor Juan's nodding his head. He's seen it, okay? And he's not here, and he's in another country, so maybe he's not even watching to get me in trouble today. But especially if he gets real passionate about something, man, he gets going, he, oh, yeah, yeah, and I'm like, <laughs> I'm used to it now, so I'm like, yeah, whatever. Jason's still not used to it after all these years. He's like, Christina, tell him to look at the road. <laughs> There's a few others I know. I, I really have to look at the road because it doesn't take anything for me to start going. I, I like, listen, now the State Farm Beacon is tracking me, you guys. Don't like it. It stresses me out. Now I'm like, <gasps> Jason's like, oh, you had four phone distractions today? I'm like, Matt Horton, how dare you? <laughs> and so now I'm like really conscious of it because it's tracking me. But before I wasn't, like I didn't realize how often I'm over there. But my car helps me steer, so that's very helpful. But I was driving Braden's car that's not so fancy and doesn't have all of that. And so I was driving to Lubbock and it kept like, I'd hit the rumble strips. I'm like, oh man, thank goodness for my like lane assist that keeps me right in line. So friends, the Holy Spirit is kind of like our lane assist. It won't steer for you. He won't steer for us, but he does keep us in if we rely on him, okay? If we trust in the Holy Spirit, he will help keep us on that path. There are a lot of things to look at. When I first moved here, every time I saw cows, I was enamored. Oh, look at the cows. We didn't see cows. All I saw were buildings everywhere. Um, and, and so we have to keep our eyes. Don't look to the left or to the right. When we are over there looking at all of the things that so busy, so concerned, about what's going on over here or what's going on over there, and we have taken our eyes off of Jesus, then we are falling into the enemy's plan, not God's plan for us. We just fix our eyes on Jesus. That does not mean, hear me, that we ignore everything that's going on around us, but everything, as we view the things going on around us, we are looking at them through the lens of Jesus. We see those things the way that Jesus sees them. We respond to those things the way that Jesus has called us to respond to them because our eyes are fixed on him. So we go where he wants us to go. We do what he wants us to do. It doesn't mean that we live in a little bubble and we don't see or hear anything that's happening around us. No, it means that all of that is filtered through our understanding of who Jesus is 
in our response to who Jesus is. Colossians 3.24, the last one in this section. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. If you, are, if you are a believer in Jesus, if you have put your faith in him as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, you have been raised with Christ. And he says, since you have been raised with Christ, a new person, set your heart on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Again, that does not mean, well, you know, it doesn't matter that there's, you know, there's some people over here and they're hungry. They have no food, but that's an earthly thing, right? They, I have heavenly food for them. No, that's not what that says. It says that our hearts and our affections are ordered according to the scriptures, according to the teaching of Jesus, so that when we see a hungry person, we respond the way that Jesus did because our hearts are ordered and our priorities are ordered according to Jesus's life an example, and to his commands. So it, it, when we see someone uh, living a harmful, sinful lifestyle, that doesn't mean that we run and we duck and cover. It means that we love them because Jesus loves them. And it means that we speak the truth in love with grace and truth, right? And it means that we respond to the situations and the difficulties around us according to the word of God and to the life and example of Jesus. Because our eyes are fixed on him. Our hearts don't love the same things that we used to love before we came to him. Our, our hearts love the things that God has called us to love and created us to love. And so beat distraction with focus. Focus on Jesus. Number two, we beat discouragement with faithful fortitude. So discouragement is different than distraction. Because discouragement really is a state of being. It is something that we... we we enter into a place where we go, where we become that. We become discouraged because maybe different things have happened in life. It's not like, well, distraction, that could be so many different things. But distraction can lead to discouragement, but other things can lead to discouragement as well. And it can be things that are well beyond our control. Sometimes even discouragement comes as a result of being focused on Jesus. Because we're obedient, because we're focused on Jesus, we start to see the need around us, and we are faithful in Christ to try to meet that need by the power of the Spirit, and even doing that brings disappointment, and then that disappointment brings discouragement because maybe we don't see the result right away that we were hoping to see, and the discouragement sets in. Maybe it, be, it comes as a result of a chronic illness in our lives where we have prayed and we have believed God for divine healing, and we know that he's more than able to provide that, but in his sovereignty, and, and the, the timing hasn't come, and that healing hasn't come. And so we become discouraged, because even though we believe for a miracle, we haven't realized that miracle. And so discouragement sets in. And what can happen if we're not careful is the enemy can use that discouragement to take our focus off of Jesus. The enemy can use that discouragement to cause us to throw up our hands and say, I give up. Forget it. What point is there in serving Jesus anymore? What good does it do for me to serve the Lord if all that I experience is disappointment in my life? And we can become very discouraged. And that is a result of being human, friends. It's not a result of being sinful. It's just a result of living in a sinful world. That we experience discouragement in all shapes and sizes and different forms. But when we look at the life of Paul, we see the example of a person who once he came to know Jesus, once he had that life-changing encounter with Jesus, and he was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he began preaching the true gospel of Jesus, he experienced some really difficult things in life. I mean, he was beaten, he was imprisoned, he was shipwrecked, he was bitten by snakes. <laughs> he had all sorts of things happen to him. So if there's anyone who could get discouraged, it would be Paul, but let, let, listen to how, what he says in Galatians 6, 9, let us not be weary, discouraged, and doing well. For in due season, we shall reap if we faint not. So he's like, look, you and I, we may put everything into it. And it can be tiresome and it can be disappointing. But don't get tired. Don't get so discouraged that you give up. 
Because in due season, in due time, when God says it's time, we're going to see results from the labor. We're going to see something good come from this. The reality may be that we don't see that until we're on the other side of eternity. But we will see it. He also says in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, and 8, talking about all of this trouble. He says, look, we have this great treasure, the joy of the gospel that we carry with us. The responsibility to tell people about Jesus and to give them the life-changing hope of Christ. But he says, we have this treasure. We carry around this treasure in jars of clay, fragile pots, to show the all-surpassing power is from God and not us. We are hard-pressed on every side, but not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not abandoned. Struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may also be revealed in our mortal body. So then, death is, not, is at work in us, but life is at work in you. It is written, I believe, therefore I have spoken. Since we have the same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and be present and present us with you to himself. All this for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we are wasting away, some of us it feels like more quickly than others, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day. For our light and our momentary troubles, light and momentary troubles, shipwrecks, and beatings, and starvation, and imprisonment, he calls those light and momentary troubles, are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes, not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what, we, what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. Guys, all that we do, all that we experience in our bodies, in our minds, in our souls, the, the, the discouragements that come, the disappointments that come from doing what God has called us to do. Though it feels like we are shriveling away as a result of it, when people who we're ministering to look in at us, if we remain faithful to Christ, what it does is give them life. It gives them hope. Because they look at our lives and they see this testimony. Here is this person who has remained faithful to Christ even when life is hard. Here is this person who has every reason to throw up their hands and give up and shake their fist at God in anger. But man, they love him more than I've ever seen a person love God. Our testimony, our faithful fortitude, our perseverance, our faithfulness to Christ in the middle of difficulties is what gives life to the people around us. It is what gives hope and encouragement to those who are seeking for something that they cannot attain in and of themselves. That this world will never be able to give them. Because is there anything that this world has? It is bandwagon fair weather fans. Because as soon as they, ju as soon they jump on a bandwagon and as soon as that one disappoints them, they're going to jump on the next one. But what we have as Christians is a 2,000 year history of people who through the worst situations and circumstances have been able to remain faithful to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Because when they have remained faithful to the point of death, the word just spreads even more because people are inspired by that type of faithfulness. And if we have a God who is always faithful, we don't have to question the faithfulness of our God because it was revealed to us in a human being who strung up on a cross naked for us. So we see the faithfulness of God in Christ on the cross. So we don't question his faithfulness. We prove our faithfulness. When life gets hard, it's easy to be faithful when things are great. When we are just, oh, it's all cheery and it's roses and it's wonderful. It's easy. But when everything is stripped away, because we have been faithful, it's difficult. But because the Holy Spirit lives in us, we, like Paul, can say the same thing. Hey, these are just light and momentary troubles. 
Because the crown of glory that we'll receive when we see Jesus face to face, that outweighs all of this. And that's what we fix our life and our eyes to. It's like Job, right, who had everything taken from him. Everything. Everything stripped away. And then his friends start to turn on him and tell him, well, you're going through this because of your sin. And so you can read in, in Job, and I think it's chapter 19, this, this, long, this long speech that Job goes into where he's like, man, it's not my sin that's caused this, but it is the hand of God. <laughs> he's like, God's allowed this in my life. And he starts to really, you think, man, he's about to give up. He's complaining. He's going on. He's this, on this rant about how God has really struck him and taken everything from him, and it's really difficult. And it sounds like he's just, he's just like throwing up all of this just discouragement and disappointment to the Lord. But then he says something towards the end of the, the, that chapter. He says, yet I know this. That my redeemer lives and will walk this earth. See? That's what happens. If you read, listen, read Psalms. Read the Psalms of Lament. Google Psalms of Lament and you'll find a whole section of Psalms that are dedicated to give voice to the hurt, the discouragements, and the disappointments of this life. But what they all have in common is that as the psalmist is writing and saying, man, woe is me, this is terrible, this is so hard. There's always a point in time where there is a transition that says, yet, or but, or even still. And David says, when he says, all of this is terrible, but I know this, that I will experience the goodness of God in the land of the living. And friends, that is for us. It's not to say that we have to shove our disappointments down, that we can't utter the, dis the discouragements that we face, that we can't go to God and give voice to our hurt. Absolutely not. He gives us the words in scripture for us to voice those hurts and concerns. But it's that we don't allow those to become the strategy of the enemy that overwhelms us and keeps us from remaining faithful to Christ. In the middle of our lament, in the middle of our sorrow, in the middle of the disappointments, there needs to be a point in time where we rise up and we say, yet I know this my redeemer lives. Yet I know this, I will see the goodness of God in the land of the living, where I will remain faithful until the very end. It's what the whole testimony of the book of Revelation is, that these people who are experiencing unimaginable, ter terrible tribulation, those who remain faithful to the end will see the Lamb of God who was slain from the foundations of the world, and he is also the Lion of Judah who will come and who will destroy all evil and set everything to right. So we do not allow our discouragement to overwhelm us, but we beat it with faithful fortitude. Keep on going, don't give up, remain faithful to Christ. Thirdly, we beat discontentment with fulfillment in Christ. So I think this is another one of the enemy's really good tactics to get Christians off course so focused on their own selves, so inwardly uh, focused that they lose sight of what they have been called to do, to bring glory to their creator before the world and to draw people unto him. And it's discontentment, just never happy with what we have, always looking for the next thing. And it's really hard because we've been conditioned for this since the time we were born. I mean, literally, the culture conditions us, the world conditions us to always want the next best thing. I have an iPhone, I think this is a 12, that was given to me by someone who upgraded and they gave me their phone. Do you know how many times I'm like, I wonder if I need the 14? Why do I think that? Because Apple tells me I need it. I'm holding off, be proud. Discontentment, all that. It, I'm not even gonna go into the shoes. Okay, I am. <laughs> I lied. <laughs> like, why? 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 Guys, let me tell you something. I went to Dallas. Pastor and I were in, um, well, really, we were driving to um, the children's home in Fairfield, outside of Fairfield. Um, but your pastor, my father, loves him some shopping, and don't ever let him tell you otherwise. Let's go to the outlets. He also loves a good deal. He never, I don't think he ever buys something and it's not on sale. So let's go to the outlets. So I was like, all right. I don't like shopping. I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm cheap. I don't like spending money. And I don't like looking for things 
if I don't have money to buy it? Like, why am I going to look? This is not fun to me. But we went to the outlets. They're having a good old time. And here's what we saw. And let me tell you, Pastor, now I was going to buy it. He's like scanning, looking up prices. Mm, that's not a good deal. No, no, no. I was like, <laughs> so I was just over there sitting, chatting on my phone. Um, and what I saw were these people loading up wagons. Doop, 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 doop. With they, they were scanning too. And I guess what they're doing is looking to see what the resale price of these things are. So that if they can get it for cheap, really, you know, a lot more discounted, then they can sell it at a higher price and they're making a good profit. So they bring wagons and they load them up with shoeboxes. And they make whole businesses. I'm pretty, pretty good living if I had to bet. Because people will pay the money to get those things at the resale price. And that resale price is even more than the retail price. It's crazy. But this is the culture that we live in. Where you need to have the newest and best. Because if you don't, you're not cool. You're not, that you're, nope, you're not good enough. And listen, I'm not saying that we can't have nice things. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that as believers we have to take a vow of poverty. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is we have to learn to be content with what we have. Because we will never be happy until we are content in Christ. Until we understand that all that we need, all that we need for life and godliness, all that we need for abundant living is found only in Christ Jesus. Because when we get to that point, we can have all the material things in the world and we're content. Or all of those things can be stripped away from us and we still have the same contentment. Because the contentment is not based on those things. It is based on our knowledge of who Jesus is. In our relationship in him. In our position in him before God. 1 Corinthians 10. And this is a long one. It's 1 through 13. And this is where Paul is talking to the believers in Corinthians. And he's like, look guys. Learn from our history. Learn from our ancestors. Because if we can learn from them. Then we can avoid doing the same thing they did. Because what was happening is they're getting together at their meetings in the church at Corinth. And they're like acting like gluttons during the Lord's Supper. And they're getting drunk and they are excluding poor believers and people are leaving hungry and other people have a lot. And he's like, let's just chill out here and let's learn to be content. Like, let's learn what it is to be content in Christ and who he has made us to be. And so he gives them some instructions beforehand leading up to chapter 11. This is in chapter 10. He says, look, I don't want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they passed through the sea. The, remember that? They were led through the wilderness by a cloud. They passed through the Red Sea. He's talking about the, the Israelites. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. So he's saying, like, he's reading back into the Old Testament. Even then, Christ is present in the provision that the Israelites were experiencing in their wilderness, okay? Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. So he's about to tell them like, hey, they experienced the provision of God. They saw the goodness of God. Nevertheless, they grumbled. They complained. They did all sorts of things. So let's learn from their example. So he goes into now what they did. Do not be idolaters. What did they do? They made idols, remember, as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test Christ as some of them did and were killed by snakes. God, please, no. <laughs> and do not grumble. Okay, so he's like idolatry, sexual immorality. Grumbling? Yep. Do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the culmination of the ages has come. That's Jesus. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you do not fall. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out for you so that you can endure it. Guys, when we are discontent, when we are looking for fulfillment in anything other than Christ, we are no different than the Israelites wandering through that wilderness. The reason they made 
gold, a golden calf and had a, a mass orgy and gave sacrifices to this calf while Moses is up getting the Ten Commandments is because they were discontent. They did not understand that their God delivered them and had good and great things for them. They stopped trusting in God. They stopped being content in God. And so they had to make their own God. And we're no different today. Every time that we're looking for fulfillment in anything or anyone other than God, we are making for ourselves golden calves. We are making for ourselves idols. Sometimes the idol is us. Sometimes the idol is a significant other. Sometimes the idol is an item or a thing or money, whatever it is. But idolatry is a result of discontentment. And when we are discontent, it will come out in our grumbling and our complaining, just like it did with them. So where do we find our peace? Where do we find our sense of contentment? In 1 Timothy 6, 6 to 10, it says, Godliness with contentment is great gain. Not just God. Well, I'm holy, Pastor Christina. I don't cuss. I don't, I don't kill anybody. Good, I'm glad. I don't, be, I don't steal. I, don't, I keep all of those Ten Commandments. Are you content? Because the commandments say don't covet. Don't covet things and don't covet people. Be content. And in, in 1 Timothy, Paul's telling Timothy, like, hey, teach your people that godliness with contentment, understanding to just be content with where you are and with what you have, that is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money, not money, the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Guys, let me tell you something that we have witnessed, I have witnessed in the 18 years that I have been in in ministry. There are people who come to the Lord and they have nothing. And they find Jesus and they find this sense of contentment and joy and passion and fervor that is indescribable because it only comes from the grace of God. And they find so much in Jesus that they are serving and they are loving and they are giving and they are generous. And then something weird happens occasionally to some people who have found that as they have been faithful to the Lord and they, they honor him with the first of what they have through the tithe and everything, and God blesses them and they get job promotions and they get more things, that something happens and in a, in a, in a, a shift takes place where it's not that those are blessings from the Lord meant to be used to glorify the Lord and to enjoy for the Lord uh, as a testimony for the Lord's goodness. But then those things become the things that they desire. That becomes the goal. And so they'll get another job, a better job. And now it's like, well, hey, hey, I haven't seen you in a while. I saw you decline today. Is everything all right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just got to put in an extra shift. I got, and oh, okay, I understand. And then the occasional missing becomes a habit. And what happens is that becomes everything that they pursue. They are pursuing wealth. They are pursuing things at the expense of fellowship and connection with the people of God, at the expense of serving God with the gifts that he has placed inside of them. That is a command in scripture for them to do. And, and, and something happens, and eventually they're completely disconnected from the family of God. And I don't want to see that happen to any of you. None of these pastors want to see this happen to any of you. Because... Paul didn't want Timothy to see his congregation through it, go through it. It's, it's as, as old as time. It's nothing new. Our culture is not more materialistic than any culture in the past. The sin has been around forever as long as sin has been. And Timothy's telling him, look, we have seen people be plunged into destruction because of their love for money and material things. Be content in Jesus. Work hard, yes. Provide for your family, yes, but be content in Jesus and understand that enough is enough and that he will take care of the needs that you have. Be content in Jesus. Don't let the trap of the enemy destroy you. So beat discontentment with fulfillment in Christ. And then lastly, beat disassociation with fellowship. Beat disassociation with fellowship. So again, 
I think these kind of build on each other. Every time you see one of these, it, it usually leads to one of the other. I think discouragement is one of the most common things that will lead to disassociation. So you become discouraged, things are happening in your life, and, and you're disappointed, and then disappointment moves to discouragement. And what happens when we're disappointed is we feel like maybe we don't um, have place in the people of God anymore. For different reasons, maybe it's guilt, uh, maybe it's just you don't want to have to deal with the questions. I don't want to have to tell one more person everything's fine. But for different reasons, mainly because it is an attack of the enemy, and he works this way, we pull back and we disassociate ourselves from the people of God. And I'm sure you've seen the meme. I think actually someone just posted it recently um, in our family group. And it's like the zebras are out there on the field. And it's like if, if, uh, if a Christian without a church was a, was a picture and it's the one zebra that's all by itself and the, the lion is attacking the zebra all by itself. Because that's what it's like. You, you isolate yourself from the people of God you are the one branch that detaches, thinks that you can somehow avoid the other branches. So in doing so, you're actually detaching yourself from the vine. And you're, you're open for attack. One of the most important things in a football game is the offensive line. Protecting the quarterback, setting up, making holes for the running backs to get through where they need to go. Right? Is that it is an offensive position, but it is also defensive at the same time. And when we're part of the family of God, we are, we are connected and we are built up and we are strong. Because even in our discouragement, even in our disappointments, there are people around us who can hold, up, uh, hold us up the way that Aaron and her held up Moses' arms when he was tired, leading the people in battle. And so the enemy would love nothing but to get the people of God disassociated, disconnected from the family of God. Because that's when we become weak. That's when we become susceptible to all sorts of other attacks. So what is it? What is it that we have to do? We have to be very intentional about making time for Christian fellowship. Not just coming. I'm not talking about not just coming here on Sunday morning. Because this really isn't fellowship. This is corporate worship. I'm talking about making it a point for there to be times in my week and times throughout the month where I am associating and connecting and building myself up with the presence of other believers. Where I don't give up meeting together. So here's what it says in Hebrews 10.25. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. But let us encourage one another and all the more as we see the day approaching. That doesn't say anything about getting together and worshiping God corporately. Let us not give up meeting together and hearing the pastor preach a sermon. Let us not give up meeting together and participate in a Bible study class. Let us not give up together and, and, and stop participating in the singing of corporate worship. It says encouraging one another. It says don't stop fellowshipping and encouraging one another. When the early church met in Jerusalem, they met every day. We know they were Pentecostal because that's how the old school Pentecostals used to do it when I was growing up. I mean, if you weren't, you went to church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday, and then all sorts of other reasons. They had, they had no reason to come. You didn't need a reason to go to church. I was in church all the time. And my parents were not in ministry at the time. My dad worked a full-time job as a carpet installer running his own business and would sometimes not get home until 6 o'clock, all sweaty, smelling like carpet and sweat. It's still a smell that I like. Don't ask me. I'm weird. <laughs> Regina was working at a law office as either a, a paralegal, a legal secretary, and she would have to leave at 5. And leaving from, you, you might be 10 miles away, but it would be 45 minutes of traffic to get back home because of all of the cars. And we would still get there, and we would be ready to serve. Because it wasn't just something that we did. Church was the family of God that we belonged to. And even as hard as the day may have been, maybe my dad had to pull up a carpet full of pee that day. It's happened. He's told me the stories. He pulled them up in nursing homes. Or maybe Regina had the attorney chew her out that day. They never, not once, you guys, I'm not exaggerating, not once did they come home and say, you know what, forget it. We're not going to Wednesday night tonight. It was too hard of a day. I'm too tired. You guys are fighting with each other. We're just staying home. Not once in my life do I remember that. Always. It was just not negotiable. 
And it wasn't legalistic. It wasn't out of a sense of duty and obligation. It was truly out of a sense of understanding the importance of being with the people of God. We could have done an at-home Bible study. My dad was more than capable to lead us. Hey, you know what? Let's just, we're going to just do a devotion here today. But we didn't because it wasn't just about our personal spiritual growth in God, although that is important. It was about corporately gathering with the people of God. The other thing that I was, it was beautiful in my life is that after Sunday night church, hey, we're going to go to pass to this person's house and we're going to go to this person's house. And my friends had friends who were Christians. And so my sister and I and my brother and sister and I, we hung out with believers. So when we thought of fun, we didn't think of drunken parties. We didn't think of all sorts of weird debauchery and people talking about each other and people cut. No, what we saw growing up from the time we were this big was fun meant laughing. Fun meant playing games that were fun and, 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 and people just having a good time, swimming in the pool and, and my dad and my friend's dad throwing us into the pool and having a good time. We're multi-generationally, we sat together in groups of people who loved the Lord and we had fun together. Not because we had to, but because we wanted to. They showed us from the time we were young the importance of that connection. And it's something that I love to give to our kids now. So when, when, when we can't go to connect group, we have it. Every, every once in a while, Pastor Jason and I have, have had to miss connect group. And what happens? Oh, Mom, is it connect group tonight? It's a connect group. Yeah, but dad and I can't. Well, can we go? Can we go? We don't want to miss. And so Pastor Juan and Audrey get the joy of having my kids there without us. And so hopefully they behave. They're probably better when I'm not there. <laughs> Guys, that is what it takes for us to remain encouraged. It's not just sitting in this room, although I love you sitting in this room. This is important and this is necessary. But it's more than this. It's being together. It's what the classics did on Friday night, having some really good fajitas and having a good time. It's what the youth group does when they get together outside of just their main Wednesday night and they have a good time. But that is corporate and that is structured. Can we start doing that organically? Can you start making time in your life? If you can make time to be at a volleyball court four times a week, if you can make time to be at the t-ball field, at the soccer field, guys, for, I'm talking, you guys are there all the time. Then most certainly you can say, you know what, I'm sorry. We can't come to practice today because we're hanging out with our friends from church. And you're going to show your kids something that that soccer field will never teach them. It baffles me that, like, I'm on a soapbox, and I'm really sorry if I'm hurting feelings because that's not my intention. But, guys, this is true. Why is it okay that we can disappoint a serve team? We can call in, and we can all decline on the same day for a serve team so that our pastors over there have nobody working with them because all of their serve team is at a sports event. But we can't disappoint the sports team. Oh, well, no, I have a responsibility to the team. I'm a part of the team. Is this not a team? I'm, I want you to think about that. Please think about it. It matters. It matters, and it's the way God designed it to be. This has eternal, lasting impact. Beat disassociation with fellowship. And I'm talking to you parents because here's the thing. If you can show them this now, the same way that the world shapes and forms us and teaches us what the good life is, with movies and commercials, and with, when you grow up as a little kid and you watch the media, what do you think the good life is when you get to high school? Parties, sex, drugs, drinking. That's what you think the good life is. That's what the cool kids do. That's what this coming of age is all about. But if you can form them from the time that they're little, that church isn't just coming and hearing a message, that church is belonging to a family that has a really good time, that you can laugh and have fun and go to movies and play games, and people will love you and accept you no matter who you are or what you do, teach them that when they're little and when they're adults, they'll be teaching their kids the same thing. That's what it's about. Beat disassociation with fellowship. Romans 12, 4 and 5. Just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so we in Christ, though many, form one body. Each member belongs to all the others. We are not individual Christians apart from the body of Christ. To be in Christ means to be in his body, each of us connected. When the Spirit comes into our life at the moment of our conversion, he baptizes us into the body of Christ in the unseen. We don't see it happen, but he drenches us. He connects us into a whole movement of people who belong to Jesus. We are not by ourselves. We are together, one body. 
This is how Paul writes to the Philippians. And I think it's so beautiful. It says this, whatever happens, guys, there's going to be a lot of stuff that comes your way. There's going to be a lot of the enemies attacks that come at you. But whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the good news, the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come to see you or only hear about you in my absence, if people only just hear about you, Plainview First Assembly, what's going on there? They may not see us, but they will hear. Here's what we will know, that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel. Because we are connected and because we fellowship and because we are built up and encouraged through one another, we fight this battle as one person, moving in God's direction, one body fixed to the head who is Christ, moving as Christ calls us to move. We're not all these separate little people doing, oh, here, here. No, contending for the faith in one spirit, the Holy Spirit, by the power of Jesus Christ. So beat disassociation with fellowship. I'm going to skip the verse in Acts because I already alluded to it, 2-4, where they, they met together all the time. But here's what I want to say, guys, is that the enemy has a strategy. He employs it every single day. You probably don't even need me to tell you that because you have experienced those attacks, even probably as you came to church here this morning. But here's what maybe you forget sometimes, and sometimes I forget, that we have to identify his strategy, that we have to call it out for what it is, that we have to remember we're not fighting against flesh and blood, that we are fighting a very real enemy who wants to steal, to kill, and to destroy us. But we also serve a God who has put his spirit in us so that we can remain faithful to the end. And he doesn't just call us to do that without any plan, without any guidelines, without any assistance. He calls us and he puts us together in a body who will encourage us and keep us encouraged so that we can keep going, so that we can remain focused and faithful and in fellowship with one another. He calls us to it and he empowers us to do it. And so as we close today, I want to encourage you with what happens when we remain faithful to the very end. In Revelation 21, 1 through 7, here is the picture that we will see. I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They, his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Every discouragement is gone. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. Guys, that is, we have been given the strategy, and that is the end zone. That is the goal. That is the Stanley Cup. That's the championship medal. That is what we're looking forward to. That's what we get to win.